<laughs> and we're going to wait for that recording. All right. Nice. Um, we're going <laughs> to, that's the most important piece. Um, we're going to, um, well, not the most important piece, but it's an important piece. We're going to introduce Dr. Shin again for our breakout session this afternoon. He's going to talk a little bit about supporting growth and development and powerful interventions through database decision making. So I'm just going to let him take it away. Screen share. Good afternoon, everybody. Okay, where's my presentation, keynote? Somebody might notice the colors I've chosen. I'm, I'm sure I've, I've pleased somebody with my orange and black, but uh, probably jeopardized a relationship with others who might prefer sort of a reddish tone to my presentation. So uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, we are now diving into something uh, that I'd like to consider my area of expertise, and that is uh, database decision making. I hope that's not up at the top, the screen sharing thing. I hope that that's not uh, in the way. So this is entitled uh, Supporting Growth and Development and Powerful Early Intervention. And uh, there's my contact information. You should have a set of handouts if you would like them and a couple things uh, for you to be able to read. So um, can, is this obstructing? Oh, you look good. But you hit mute somehow, you got muted. Okay. Let's go back here. Sorry, gang, I must have hit the space bar. So my areas of expertise are um, curriculum-based measurement, which was developed in the late 70s, early 80s on a federal funded research center uh, to help identify uh, simple methods. And the key concept is simple methods uh, for teachers uh, to be able to monitor progress uh, for students who were uh, uh, either IEPs or significantly discrepant. And that's trans, uh, that has always been a cornerstone of MTSS implementation. So uh, I've written a couple of books on curriculum based measurement. They're edited books with contributions by some very famous people in the field of general and special education. And I was one of uh, six members of the technical review panel for the original National Center for Student Progress Monitoring that developed the technical standards that have been uh, used and modified uh, for more than uh, 15 years now. So uh, I've, you know, I've written a lot about this topic and um, hope I can share some of the lessons learned, uh, not from research, but from practice, okay? So um, there's a disclosure statement I'm not going to go over it, but basically, um, I don't. I, I will be talking about a few commercial products, but you need to know that I no one's paying me to say anything about it. Okay, I, I helped the development of Ames Web, and uh, when it was purchased by Pearson, I was a consultant for a few years. But that consulting relationship is done. I contributed to the early development, and I mean early, like pre-1998 development of Dibbles. Um, I helped uh, McGraw-Hill and uh, Voyager Cambium with their progress monitoring components of their intervention program. And as I said earlier this morning, I'm a member of the National Advisory Board for the Consortium on Reaching Excellence. So that's sort of my, my background, okay? A uh, couple things that I've given you to read. Uh, one is uh, a, a chapter from the Handbook on Evidence-Based Practices for Emotional and Behavior Disorders. Uh, Hill Walker and Frank Gresham asked me to help uh, to write a chapter on progress monitoring methods for academics. And then uh, I, a, a chapter from the NASP Interventions book that I edited where um, I had license to do the longest title in the history of any book chapter, I swear. So uh, you can read those at, at your leisure, okay? Um, if you really want to dive deeper in really good progress monitoring and screening, uh, read this book, which was designed as a testimony 
uh, 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 what's called a fest trip to the to uh, the work of the late Stanley Dino, uh, one of the pioneers in special education. Uh, a series of chapters uh, with an international focus about the kinds of data systems I'll be talking about uh, this afternoon. Um, I, I, it's a very interesting, I think, an engaging book. Uh, I was honored to write the summary chapter. So here's some of the things that I would like to share with respect to what I call the big ideas, okay? Now, when you talk about, as I tried to lay out this morning, uh, the features of what makes something a multi-tier system of support, um, and certainly in Oklahoma, it's database decision-making. And the two primary you know, decisions um, uh, will be around progress monitoring and screening. What assessment systems um, will we be using? Now, here's my takeaway, okay? And it goes like this. Among the difficult decisions that we make in MTSS implementation, how we, what measures we use to, to screen and monitor progress, especially in reading, is the easiest decision we will make, okay? Let me repeat that. In all the difficult decisions we make about implementing MTSS, okay, the easiest of these difficult decisions is what measurement system are we going to use? What are the measures we need to have in place at the very least to get started, okay? Here's the uh, sort of like corollary to that. If you can't agree on a data system, I'm gonna argue it's not a good predictor of your MTSS implementation success, okay? It's just not good, okay? Because again, this is pretty straightforward, I hope. And again, among the easiest. Okay, so universal progress monitoring is essential to ensure all beginning readers grow and develop, okay? And that means we're gonna, you know, at the very least through uh, fifth grade, K through five or six, we would like to, uh, to do relatively frequent, I'm going to argue three times a year, growth and development to show the kids are growing, okay? Universal screening is essential to ensure systematic early intervention for at-risk readers. Notice I've already used two terms with the word universal in front of it. Universal screening, universal progress monitoring, okay? When we combine this is a huge takeaway because people get very confused. When we combine universal progress monitoring and universal screening, this process is called benchmarking or benchmark assessment. This is where we will see sort of a fall, winter screening, uh, fall, winter, spring data collection. Many people think we're screening three times a year, and that is a major mistake, okay, to interpret the data that way. The primary reason we do multiple assessments of all kids is for growth and development. That's what benchmarking is first about. Now, we should add that, of course, we can use those data for universal screening. And of course, I'll come back to that. Now, more frequent progress monitoring is essential for students at risk or with significant reading difficulties to show that the interventions are working. The key concept of the intervention is to reduce the gap, okay? I tell my graduate students, you can probably answer a third of the questions I ever ask by just saying, reduce the gap. Okay, and it's a huge concept. For kids who are behind, when we intervene, our goal is to reduce the gap. Okay, so the ideal MTSS data system should be what? Not burdensome to teachers. 
in terms of time and cost. Now, all the publishers provide you multiple measures at multiple times. And, and I'm going to argue you have a choice to make of which of those measures that are provided to use. And I, my perspective as a person who makes his living off of assessment is this. I want to do as little assessment as possible to make good decisions. I don't want to over test kids, especially young kids. And I'm going to say those would be students in K through three. Okay. And I certainly see little purpose in multiple assessments of any kind for students in uh, uh, late middle school and early high school. The concept of benchmarking ninth graders is kind of silly to me. Uh, you, you can spend your time and money testing kids three times a year on an e-test in ninth grade, but I see little return in terms of practice and I see little return in terms of research, okay? Now, we want it to not be burdensome, but we also want it to be um, scientifically sound. So I'm going to start with some very simple premises. And you can use these premises every day in your implementation of tiered services, OK? Because I think we lose sight of some fundamental ideas. Every minute testing a kid for adults is a minute away from teaching. If I can make the same decision in five minutes as I would in 15 minutes, testing a kid for five minutes is better because I can teach more. Now, of course, one of the things that has happened in the last 10 years is an increased use of computers. Now, I'm a techie. Um, you know, I've got my Apple Watch, and my Apple Watch talks to my phone, and my phone talks to my car, and I, I love technology. But here's the other part of this stuff. For students, every minute being tested is a minute away from learning. And so we've shifted a lot of the assessment burden from adults, because again, every minute from, for testing is a minute away from teaching. But for students, every minute being tested is a minute away from learning. So if I can figure out who's progressing in reading in a short period of time, why would I assess a student longer than that? Okay. And me personally, I'm a big fan of student and teacher interaction with respect to teachers seeing how kids perform. This is called authentic assessment. Now, every time we test a kid with a computer, that is, can be good data, but it is less authentic. And I worry about uh, young kids being tested um, on the computer when we've got a whole bunch of other issues. Plus, um, students who are at risk often don't give their best effort, et cetera, et cetera. So these are a couple of my takeaways th that have driven the work that I've been doing for 40 years, okay? Now, what the research says is you don't need lots of different tests to identify students at risk or monitor progress. The idea of multiple pieces of data or converging data is a myth for many reasons, okay? Not the least of which is, you know, the reliability of different scores and a whole bunch of technical issues. But the whole notion, what we want to be able to do is have a simple, scientifically sound data system that is not burdensome to teachers. And I would add, is as authentic as possible. Now, that's not to not computerize assessment because computers can help us in this process. Okay, so 
I'm going to give you official permission, you know, if, if, if my words means anything, to keep your screening and progress monitoring in the area of reading as simple as possible. Now, I'm going to confine my comments today to reading, okay? And that be, doesn't mean that um, monitoring progress or screening in other areas is uh, not important, okay? But for, for simplicity purposes and with the most solid database, we should get, since 90% of kids at risk of, you know, have reading problems and 50% of kids with challenging behavior have reading problems, I'm going to focus on let's get the job done really, really, really well in reading and let's learn lessons from that with some of the other kinds of data we collect. Okay, so the big gorilla in all of MTSS, okay, the big gorilla uh, of measurement is this takeaway. 40 years of research and practice, if you want to know how well a kid reads, listen to them. An oral reading test is the big gorilla, okay? So grandmas know how well their kids read. They listen to them by reading a story on their lap. Kids, reading skills are apparent, strengths and weaknesses with an oral reading test. And I'm gonna say, let's get this part done really, really well. This will be our blood pressure test. It, you know, taking a, a you know a medical metaphor, or our you know our our a temperature, or height and weight, an indicator of general reading skill. Now here's the deal: you don't need to listen to them for a long time. We're going to listen to a few kids read, okay? And guess what? It doesn't take long to say, "Wow, this kid's pretty good." Okay? Now you can listen longer if you like, but if I can make a decision in a minute or two that I would make in 10 minutes of listening to kids read. Um, I think for simplicity purposes, economy purposes, in being able to allocate time to teaching, that's a good deal. Okay, so let's get into the, our repertoire. A short sample of oral reading. Now, many of the publishers call this oral reading fluency. And, and we can talk a little bit about that, but people often confuse fluency with speed. And of course, if you talk a language fluently, you're not just speaking it with speed, you're speaking it with efficiency, with subtlety, nuance, and understanding, okay? So again, we have, uh, I, I think, done harm by putting fluency in a box, okay, when in fact it's a holistic measure of general reading skill. I hope I can convince you of that. Now, this is just an illustration of all of the reading tests for young kids, whether it's Ames Web Plus, Dibbles Next, Dibbles 8, Edition, Easy CBM, Fast Bridge, iReady, or Map. Okay. And guess what? E even Map now includes a measure of oral reading. Isn't it interesting that all of these publishers have a foundation of oral reading? Now, look across publishers, across all the other different measures you can give. You know, in Fast Bridge, you, they take a composite called early reading, which is four of 12, 12, get it? Subtests of reading skills, okay? Now, pretty much everyone includes letter names. Some people, though not all, include letter sounds, which is super important. You know, most of these publishers are doing phoneme segmentation. Most of the publishers are doing nonsense words. Uh, some of the publishers are doing single word reading. Um, and guess what? The correlation with single word reading and passage reading is like super high, 0.80 or greater. It's 
redundant to measure both of those things. Now, if a school chooses uh, or a district chooses to do a comprehensive or more thorough assessment, um, that's a choice that you're making. But most of the measures, although promised as diagnostic, are actually too short to inform teaching. And there's actually very little return on helping people uh, plan interventions from collecting each of these data. We'll talk more about that. But I'm gonna try to get us to focus on, let's get really good at an oral reading test. Okay. Now he, these are most of the uh, you know, big data systems out there that are used in MTSS that are not primarily computer driven, okay? And, 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 and I know a fair amount about each of them and they all use the same research database, okay? Each of them has their own strengths and each of those things have their own weaknesses or points of vulnerability. So it's important to be a really good consumer. But again, let's go back to that theme that all of these publishers, okay, including MapNow um, and including Renaissance Learning and STAR have an oral reading component. So somebody's caught on to the research. That should tell you something. Now, this is a comparison of about how much time it takes to do things like, you know, if you would use an oral reading test uh, from Ames Web, Dibbles, FastBridge, Easy CBM, your benchmarking would be, you know, between six to 15 minutes a year. You know, if you did a benchmarking using MAP for reading, I'm gonna estimate it's about three hours using the publisher's, uh, you know, guidance. Um, iReady would be, you know, two and a half to three hours. STAR would be, you know, 45 minutes. For progress monitoring, the amount of time goes uh, up uh, more for um, an oral reading test within the uh, CBM, curriculum-based measurement family, Ames Web, Dibbles, Easy CBM. Uh, a yearly progress monitoring of weekly progress is about an hour. To do that in MAP would be about 11 hours. Um, iReady, you can't be used to do that. And STAR would be about eight hours. I want something as time efficient as possible. And again, I'll throw in, I do like my, as authentic as possible in areas where we can do that. Now, let's listen to a first grader uh, read uh an, an oral reading passage okay one minute this is a standardized test highly researched all right emma thank you so much for doing this for me i know you read these before and you're such a good reader so i'm very excited to hear you and when i say begin start reading a lot at the top of the page and read across the page okay. try to read each word and if you come to a word you don't know, I'll tell it to you. Be sure to do your best reading. Are there any questions? No. Okay. Ready? Begin. And small guy rug, and sat on the rug, and the rug felt soft, and sat by a bug. Now the bug had on a hat, and saw six bugs. The bugs had on hats. The bugs had on red and black hats. I am mad, Mom yelled. I do not want bugs on my rug. Anna's mom picked up the rug. Mom picked the rug. Mom, the bugs hung on the rug. We will not jump off, the bugs yelled. I will wash the rug, said Anna's mom. The bugs must go. Mom ran water. The rug got wet. The bugs got wet. Anna's Mom left the rug in the sun. A rug got hot. We like the sun, said the bug said. The bug yelled. Mm -hmm. And mom put a rug back in the hall. Mom you can stop right there. Wow, Emma. Great, you almost finished it. All right. Okay, that's a simple measure of oral reading. Uh, this was collected, I believe, in like 
February or March of first grade. Uh, when I use this passage with professional educators, I have yet to find an educator who said, wow, this is pretty good reading, okay? I mean, or this is not pretty good reading. And we'll come back to this. Now, notice that the examiner said, you've read this before. Yeah, she actually read it in kindergarten. And I'll show you how she read it then, okay? The gorilla. If we could get this kind of simple measurement as an institutional practice, where any educator, if they wanted to know how well a kid read, would do something very straightforward. Now we can do more than this if we need to for information about you know, instructional purposes. But for purposes of screening, I would say, Anne does not have a reading difficulty. For purposes of progress monitoring, we'd have to compare her reading to how she read at an earlier point in time. Okay, now let's take a look at a fourth grader reading. When lesson begins, start reading at the top of this page. Read across the page, try to read each word. If you come to a word you don't know, I'll tell it to you. Be sure to do your best reading. Are there any questions? No? Okay. Begin. It was a pretty good composition. I felt proud knowing the best. I was, it was the best one at my school. After I'd read it five times, I was impatient to start reading it out loud. I followed the book's directions again. First, I read the composition out loud without trying to sound impressive, just to hear what the words sounded like. I did that a couple of times, and I moved over to my polite mirror and read the composition loud in front of it a few times. At first, I just read it, then I practiced looking up and making eye contact. Of course, I was making eye contact with myself, and that felt pretty silly. That was what the book said to do. Then I went on to reading the composition to an audience. This side. No. I don't have the whole passage on the page, but I have yet to encounter an educator who doesn't say, wow, this uh, first grade or fourth grade reader reading fourth grade text, not bad, okay? Pretty good reading. I would not say this is a student that uh, I'm worried about with respect to needing uh, intervention. This student is not at risk. This student is not a discrepant reader. For screening purposes, this kid is okay. Now, listen to this student. This is a fourth grader reading the same passage. Start reading aloud at the top of the page. Read across the page. Try to read each word. If you come to a word that you don't know, I'll tell it to you. Be sure to do your best reading. Are there any questions? Okay. It's a pretty good competition. I feel I felt probably knowing this was a best one. At my school, after I read a few times, I feel important to start reading out read it out loud. I followed the book in directions again. First, I read the competition out. Load about trying to stand important impressive impressive just to her now when i work with educators what i usually do when i'm in person is i ask them to raise their hand when they have heard enough of billy's reading to say he might be a good candidate for intervention. And for many educators, 
okay? Especially teachers who teach fourth grade, their hands go up after about 10 seconds. 15 seconds is a long time. You know, 20 seconds, probably most of the hands in the room are up. This simple, authentic assessment of reading is very well researched and is useful as a short screener that can help us identify candidates for potential intervention. It is also sensitive to growth over time. That means it will change when students are improving in their reading skill. Now we start this process, okay, by understanding what we're doing in screening is we're trying to identify those students who are a, sig, sig, sufficiently different from other students that they would have a key term that we all need to be consistent about. They would have what's called a, a performance discrepancy in reading. We're measuring the performance discrepancy. And one of the challenges we have when we're implementing MTSS, okay, Oklahoma and elsewhere, is getting a consistent vocabulary that is uh, used, okay? And in fact, I wish we, uh, I encourage people that as they're implementing a tiered services model, they actually develop a consistent vocabulary glossary to help people, uh, uh, you know, kind of use common language. Differences in language lead to differences in, in uh, interpretation, and I would argue differences in practice. Is Billy significantly different in his reading skills from other kids that intervention may be warranted? Now notice I didn't say is, because I'm gonna be talking about professional data-based decision-making, data-based, not data alone, because we need our judgments about not only the quantity of performance, but the quality of performance, okay? So if we would graph Billy's performance, okay, and this is an old Ames web, notice the copyright date, 2002. These data are more recent than that. But Billy was reading about 55 words a minute, correct, with like 17 errors, okay, which is not good. We'll come back to that. Billy is that blue dot there on that graph. Green would be the range of reading scores of average or typical students. That is, the top of the bar, around 130, would be scores at the 75th percentile. At the bottom part of that green box would be the 25th percentile. The green line is the median or the 50th percentile. Billy's scores are not in the average range. In fact, Billy's scores are not in the below average range, which would be on that orange bar. That orange bar extends from the 25th percentile to the 10th. The blue bar would be our above average readers, students who read from the 75th percentile to the 90th. And above that blue bar would be students above in the top 10% or above the 90th percentile. You can clearly see in this picture of performance that Billy's scores are below the 10th percentile. And in screening, to me, that would suggest he might be a good candidate for a tier three intervention. Well, wait a minute. Shouldn't that student be in tier two, Billy in tier two, before he would go to tier three? We will talk about a concept later called triage. Billy is significantly different and should be placed as soon as possible in our most intensive tiered intervention. Okay. Now, there are six things that we need to also look for in addition to a quantitative score. 
I worry that we have focused too much on the numbers and not as much on how those numbers are earned. Okay, so let's review Billy. And if someone would like to see him again, they can put that in the comments. But did you believe, did you observe that Billy read with automaticity? Was it easy for him? No, he did not read with automaticity. It was herky jerky and not, not moving as we would like. Did he read with very high accuracy? And I'm going to talk about greater than 95%. No, his accuracy was really about 75% accurate. And that's terrible reading. Did Billy read with expression? Hardly at all. Did Billy engage in comprehension self-monitoring? A fancy term for did he self-correct? Good readers, when they read, and you saw that in, a in Amy, good readers will go back and self-correct. They don't say, oh, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. I better go back and reread it. All of that is transparent. Billy self-corrected on the words it and out. Not a good sign. Those are low level, like first grade, you know, sight words. Did Billy have an effective strategy for unknown words? Nope, he didn't. He probably used configuration. Configuration is, okay, I need a long word that starts with a C and ends with an N. And he's actually pretty good at a bad strategy. Now, good readers also adjust the pace. They speed up, they slow down. They speed up when the text is easier, they, speed, they slow down, when the text becomes more complex. Billy just read like a word at a time. So when we look at something like a simple oral reading test, it will yield a reliable quantitative score that we can have confidence in as a measure of general reading ability. And it also is accompanied by a series of richness richness of qualitative features that we also need to attend to, okay? I really worry that people have reduced kids down to a single number without looking at how that number is actually earned. And I actually encourage uh, my students to take notes on those qualitative features and to put them in um, any kind of text box in a, if you're doing a computerized assessment. Now, let's take a look. We've seen a student in first grade. We've seen two students in fourth grade. This test can be used as a simple screener for older kids. Under these circumstances, we're not doing universal screening. We're doing individual screening or one student as a time at a time. Here's a student in 11th grade suspected of having reading difficulties because of poor academic performance. In this case, we're going to use as our reading material, not 11th grade passages because that would be, yeah, there's a lot of reasons why we tip the basic skill passages stop at grade eight under you know, well-designed uh, assessment systems. This is grade seven. And we can spend a whole bunch of time talking about why grade seven, if that comes up um, later on. Okay, so let's listen to this student and uh, the, the audio gets better after about seven seconds of the student reading. When I say begin, I want you to read across the page Try to read each word. If you come to a word you don't know, I'll tell it to you. Be sure to do your best reading. Are there any questions? Nope. Begin. Yeah. Dr. Nielsen already has 10 years old, Samantha, and her 12 year old uh, brother, Robert, had heard of an old autobiography uh, slide from some of the other neighborhood children. Um, they decided they needed to check, to check it out. 
about 15 seconds will raise their hand and say they've heard enough. I'm not encouraging a 15 second uh, assessment. But what we want to pay attention to is this student's oral reading score suggests she is below what we would call a minimum basic skill proficiency level or MBSP and would be a good candidate, a good potential candidate for intervention. The quantitative data and the qualitative data suggest concern. Now, what we have seen is a data system that can be used with young kids and older kids in a tiered services model. Now, in 2004, which was the last comprehensive literature review, okay, imagine that, okay, as reported in uh, 2012, there are 585 research reports, 307 published in journals, 141 empirical studies. And since that, the research has exploded further. It is a measure, an oral reading measure, is something we can have a high degree of confidence of being a good indicator of general reading ability in most students. Not all. There'll be some funny little oddballs out there. Very unusual, but for most students that so we can use an MTSS. Now, for 20 some years, okay, the Office of Special Ed Programs has been providing standards, okay, to help us to use data systems in MTSS. The National Center for Progress Monitoring ran for five years. Remember, I was on the technical review panel for four of those years. When the money ran out, the tasks were uh, ceded to the uh, RT, National RTI Center, which published, reviewed, a test that meet standards, okay? It's been rolled over into the National Center for Intensive Intervention. The work continues. And publishers are asked, not required, publishers are asked to submit their materials for independent review by a panel of appropriately credentialed experts. One of the definitions of scientifically based, okay, in federal law. And what it does is it gives you a, you can go to these sites and it will give you a review of measures submitted by the publishers, okay? And it looks like, uh, you know, consumer reports where some things are not there, that's a dash, uh, some things which are sort of meet criteria, which is a half circle, and some things that have a full circle. Now the standards and some of the things that uh, they review to me are digging very deep into the weeds in terms of research, like classification accuracy is kind of in the weeds. It's not something that most of us think about in terms of how they derive their conclusions, but certainly reliability and validity are there plus usability features. Take a look at the charts for screening and let's use a data system that meets standards. Now, they are also charged not just with screening, but with progress monitoring. And it's the same thing, okay? Evidence of reliability and validity being provided. And 
look at the chart and select a good measure. Now let's dig deeper a little bit into oral reading, okay? Remember, uh, uh, you know, here, here we've got, you know, uh, the same student uh, that was reading in first grade. Here she is in April of kindergarten. Let's take a look at, um, at her reading uh, now or then. She's pretty quiet. Then I say begin. Start reading aloud at the top of this page. Read across the page. Try to read each word. If you come to a word you don't know, I'll tell it to you. Be sure to do your best reading. Are there any questions? She's so cute. Hmm. Hmm. Here we have a student who's not even completed kindergarten. Is this student a beginning reader? Absolutely. Quantitatively and qualitatively, we can already detect general reading skill. So let's take a look at universal screening as we dig deeper. Universal screening is when we systematically look at all kids, okay, to identify students at risk. Great. So let's take a look. Let's look at that same green bar, okay? Green bar would be average. Orange would be below average. Below orange would be well below average. Blue line would be above average, above the blue line, uh, the top 10%. Let's take a look at the student who we just read. And we can see that her score would place her as an above average kindergarten reader. Would we suspect this student is being at risk for reading difficulty? No. In, even in uh, you know, mid to late kindergarten, we can detect kids. Now, that doesn't mean we wouldn't use with really, really young kids another measure, okay, or two. But certainly, as kids are in school, we can start to use the gorilla to help us screen. Now, there's Emma. Is she at risk? Heck, no. Now, again, let's take a look at how she's doing a year later. Emma was a, an above average uh, kindergarten reader, and now she is a well above kindergarten or well above first grade reader. Oh, we're not going to have her read again. We don't want to do that. Okay. This is growth and development. Is Emma growing? Was she at risk? No. Is she growing at a rate equal to or greater than other students? She's growing at a rate greater than other students. Is she at risk now? Heck no. This is about growth and development. Growth and development. We're not just screening kids three times a year. A student who's a really good reader in second grade is not going to be at risk the next time that student is tested. But that student should be growing. Growth and development. 
super important. Now, when we put that universal progress monitoring and universal screening together, that's called benchmarking, okay? And it disturbs me when people error in saying benchmarking is screening three times a year. No, benchmark is growth and development. Let's take a look at this student's performance on an old Ames web graph. This student, and I believe it's a third grader, uh, this student in the fall was a benchmark. Is this student at risk? No, an average reader. Did this student grow at the same rate as other kids from fall to winter? Hmm, not as much. I wonder what's going on. Is this student at risk? Hmm, debatable, debatable. Certainly not well below average, but not growing at the same rate as other kids. I wonder, this is a general ed kind of thing. Let's, you know, talk to parents. Let's have a little, you know, get together. But I, in this set of circumstances, the team did, the teacher and team did not believe the student was uh, sufficiently at risk to uh, start to be a, a, in a tier two intervention. Was that a good decision? Yes. By the end of the year, this student's uh, reading, this student has actually improved at a faster rate than typically developing kids. And now this student is an average reader. This is what benchmarking is supposed to do for us. And again, it bothers me when we only use the data uh, as part of screening. We're testing awful lot of kids, many average and above readers again and again and again and again and again for screening, it's crazy. But shouldn't that high performing kid grow? Shouldn't that average reader be growing? Growth and development, first and foremost, is what we want to assure, okay? Assure, and oh, we can use those data for screening too. If we could get that far, our implementation would be so much more refined. Now let's take a look, just for the heck of it, how a second grade teacher might use the data for uh, her classroom. These are all real kids. Teeny little graphs, and let me talk about, let me uh, report them very, very, very quickly. Take a look at the, the first graph, and again, I hope your screen is big enough. Um, the, here we've got an above average reader, well above average reader, and look at that growth, okay? Same rate of growth as other kids, doing great. Here's another uh, student. Uh, wow, uh, am I concerned about this student? And not really. Look at this student. Am I concerned about this student in terms of growth and development? Nope. Do we need to be thinking about tiered services? Nope. What about this student? What about this student? Well, you know what? Growth from fall to winter was pretty good. Growth from winter to spring, not so much, but still not enough to sort of like jump on my radar screen. Now, here's a really good story, right? We saw that one. Does this student, uh, does this bother me? Nope. Here's a below average student, okay, uh, who's getting intervention and this student is improving at the same rate. I'm still concerned about this student. This student moved in from uh, in the winter, so we don't have any fall data. I'm not worried. Looks pretty good to me. Hmm. Now here's a student that did not improve uh, very much or at all from winter to spring. It warrants investigation, but it doesn't warrant uh, tier two. Here's another student that, uh, you know, sort of plateaued from winter to spring. Here's a student that was below average. This is a little worrisome. 
growing at the same rate of other kids, but still discrepant. See how we can start building a pattern of performance that can help a teacher understand individual kids? To me, this teacher deserves kudos for producing pretty positive results for most of her students and being able to see those students who may need a little bit of more careful monitoring or changes in their intervention uh, as part of tiered services. When we have students that are at risk or significantly discrepant with performance discrepancies, we want to monitor their progress more frequently. We can't afford to let three to four months go by without checking in on them. This is weekly progress monitoring for a student in tier three. The black line shows that the, the rate of expected progress here, called the aim line, and this is pretty consistent across publishers. This black line is the rate of improvement that would be reducing the achievement gap. Okay, we can talk a little bit about goal setting. Uh, maybe we'll get to that later, oh my goodness. This rate of improvement, that black line, if this student is consistently above that line, they are reducing the achievement gap. Is this student's performance consistently above that line? Absolutely. We can determine that this student is benefiting from the intervention. Their rate of improvement is reducing the achievement gap. And they may not need intervention if we keep going with this intervention, okay? So this is super important in terms of a concept. When we write goals for students at tier two, tier three, and as part of IEPs, our goal is to reduce the gap. Our intervention should show kids that are consistently above that line and interventions that are consistently below that line need to be changed as soon as possible. This student, look at this. This is really good news for that teacher, for that kid. This student is doing well. Now, let's take a look. Here's a student that uh, the first uh, three, four data points are consistently below the line. This team, and the grade level team in this case, looks at the data once a month. The intervention was implemented with integrity and they decided that, hey, look, this is not a good picture. And so they changed the intervention. Is this student now benefiting from intervention? And I would argue the student's rate of improvement is actually above the expected rate of progress. This student is now reducing the achievement gap. This is good news. This is how we use frequent progress monitoring. Now there's an awful lot of research that's been published, okay? that um, I tend to disagree with their, their, both their methods and their conclusions. And they uh, start talking about, you know, 12 data points, 16 data points, uh, da, da, da. and I think that, that that's all sort of well-intentioned, but, but uh, misguided. Because what they're doing is they're averaging all kinds of things with all kinds of funny statistical methods and moving away from the picture of progress of individual kids, which is what it was designed to do. A good intervention should produce powerful effects. A weak intervention should be detected very, very, very quickly. And this is where the expertise comes in for people that are working with data, looking at the individual circumstances and being very strategic in the judgments that they make. So frequent progress monitoring for kids that are more at risk or most at risk. Now, I'm gonna recommend 
that let's, with the exception of kindergarten kids, which I'm not going to, that exception is something I, I don't want to get us too distracted with because I would like us to be really good at a single measure, which is that strong oral reading component. It's validated for universal screening. It's validated for universal progress monitoring. It's validated for more frequent progress monitoring. Now we can do more than that. We can add in other things if you like, but I worry that by adding all of these measures, it only adds complexity and, and sort of like contaminates the decision-making process as we're learning. It's a learning curve, gang. And until we get good at a few really important things, I worry that we'll get bogged down with way too much stuff and not ever get good at decision making. So I want our staff, I want schools to get really good at interpreting and using data, okay? Because once you're really good at something really important, the generalization is really simple. The generalization is really simple once you're good at something really important. And reading certainly is it, okay? When you do this, your initial training needs are reduced, okay? When you do this, the interactions with multiple vendors and multiple measures, it's all reduced, okay? And it makes us, enable us to focus on intervention. Now, let me tell you, assessment is always uh, more seductive than the hard work of teaching, okay? Teaching is the hardest thing and assessment is seductive. It gives us the impression that we're doing powerful intervention, but often we're not. We're collecting data, but we're not really using it. And I want us to do better than that. So I like what's called a seamless data system because seamless to me is equal to simplicity. So let's take a look at comparisons for progress monitoring and benchmarking across different measures, okay? And let, these are all, you know, in terms of reviews from the uh, national centers from OSEP. Now, again, let's take a look at different measures. Let's take a look at, and I'm not promoting AIMSWeb, Dibbles, FastBridge, iReady or not. Just look at what we know. AIMSWeb reviewed favorably for benchmarking for universal screening, reviewed favorably for benchmarking for uh, universal progress monitoring, and reviewed favorably for weekly progress monitoring, as is Dibbles in all of its varieties. Measures of academic progress is reviewed favorably uh, for universal screening and is reviewed favorably for benchmarking for universal progress monitoring for growth and development, but has not been tested as a frequent progress monitoring for like use at tier two and tier three which means you'd have to have another measurement system for kids in tier two, tier three, and special ed. Now that's not seamless. It doesn't mean it's bad. It means it's you're combining map and something else, okay? The same thing with, you know, iReady. You're compare, you're using iReady for benchmarking for uh, universal screening, universal progress monitoring, but as a frequent progress monitoring tool, you need something else. Now that's not seamless, got it? Now here's the part that really bothers me because I see a lot of schools using as their data system, Fontes Pinnell Benchmark. Go to the website, the OSEF websites and find Fontes Pinnell Benchmark reviewed even reviewed as a universal screener, it's not there. Reviewed as a universal progress monitoring tool and benchmarking, it's not there. 
reviewed as a frequent progress monitoring test, it's not there. Now for me, as a, someone who wants solid practice based on research, I can live with a system that's not seamless. You know, I could live with MAP as my, as my universal, it wouldn't be my first choice for a lot of reasons, but I could live with it, okay, as a benchmarking tool for universal screening and universal progress monitoring, but I couldn't live with it as a frequent progress monitoring, so I might have to use Dibbles or AmesWeb or FastBridge or EasyCBM. But why in the world would I base an MTSS data system, which is supposed to be tied to research-based practices, a data system like Pontus Penel Benchmark? I don't get it. And this is the challenge, like I talked about this morning, of leadership to keep us on board with things that are tied to research. Now, me, I'm a big fan of Seamless, okay? Because guess what? I can do, uh, this is all gonna, my layering is all bad. Okay, let's start at the top. I can use uh, a seamless system, okay, oral reading. These are my data from benchmarking, fall, winter, spring, tier one. I can, oh my goodness, my layering is really off. The second one is I can do monthly assessment repeating the benchmark for tier two. I can do most frequent assessment, which is weekly at tier three. I can use my screening data and my progress monitoring data, my frequent progress monitoring data from tier three to help me make a decision about special ed eligibility. This is called the dual discrepancy model under RTI. I can combine both of those data and say this kid is, has a performance discrepancy and a progress discrepancy and needs special ed. And when I write a goal for special ed, I will use sort of, not exactly, the same process for writing a goal that reduces the achievement gap as I would at tier three. I have a seamless system across tier one, tier two, tier three, special ed eligibility and frequent progress monitoring for IEPs. Now, wouldn't that make life a little bit more easy if we didn't have to sit down and look at massive amounts of data collected by this person, that person, we could simplify and get really good at intervention and knowing whether things are making a difference. To me, that's the challenge in front of us. We have way too much data that we tend to not use very well. And we uh, get distracted from the hard job of teaching. Again, sorry for poor layering here. I don't know what happened. So let's dig deeper in screening. Me, I like to have grade level teams with administrative support, identify and triage potential candidates for tier two and tier three. It should take a grade level team less than an hour to identify potential candidates and discuss them. That, doesn't mean you have to talk about every single kid to identify the kids that may need the, may be the best candidates for tier two and tier three. We're gonna bring in information we know about the kids. We may look at other data, but our primary data would be that oral reading tests. Okay, not a single passage, by the way, multiple passages for, again, there's some reasons we can talk about. Oh, goodness gracious. That's really not good. My layering is really bad. Let me fix this, eek. Because this is sort of important. I'm gonna do it this way. Let me see if this works. 
Okay. Oh, goodness. At least we see it. Okay. So in the concept of screening is this thing called a cut score or a criterion. How do we decide that this kid is a, a, a good candidate for intervention? We will review that what I advocate is our cut scores are aligned to our available intervention resources. We're actually going to go through a brief uh, planning process. I'll show you how that works. Okay. And we're not going to use what I call the dreaded triangles, the kids in the red, the green, and the yellow. Okay. I, I hope I can come back to that. As a discussion point, when I work with schools, I ask this question. Do we have the resources to provide additional intervention to students in our bottom quarter? That means if I got 100 second graders, that means can I intervene with you know, 25? I'm not going to get rigid on the numbers. Can I intervene with 25 students in additional intervention? And, if, and as we go through how we would determine that, okay, uh, I, I think you know, you'll, you'll see that all of this stuff makes sense. And I'm gonna think my best candidates for tier two will be students in my bottom quarter, but not my bottom 10%. Kids in my bottom 10%, might be good candidates for tier three. I'm not gonna get rigid on that. I might have a student at the 14th percentile that the team believes is a better candidate for tier three than or tier, or tier three than tier two. We might decide that a student at the fifth percentile, although I, I doubt this would be true, a student at the fifth percentile is a better candidate for tier two than tier three. But we're going to start with this as a discussion point. Now we're going to ideally try to re avoid the triangles as our screening cut scores. Okay, and I hope I get a chance to talk about that. Database decision making includes informed judgments, and it may include other data, certainly attendance and things like that. It may include placement tests. But we're not going to get bogged down with 18,000 tests because that only increases the unreliability of the decisions we make. Okay. Now, number five, note that once we get this process up and running, we're actually not going to make our screening decisions at the beginning of the year. We're going to make them at the end of the year. So at the end of grade one, we're going to use our spring benchmark data to identify candidates for fall of second grade. We're going to use our end of third grade uh, benchmark data to identify potential candidates for fall of fourth grade. And that should take care of, in most circumstances, about 90% of the judgments and enable kids to get intervention from the first week of school rather than waiting for our benchmark period to begin. Again, there's a lot of stuff in a very short period of time, of course, that I'm not gonna be able to get into. But I will talk about triage. What I see a lot, and I mean a lot, and kudos if you don't do it this way. I see a lot of schools collect benchmark data but they don't use it. They only look at the data if the teacher refers a kid. No, let's look at the benchmark data. What a waste of time and energy for benchmarking if that's what we do. It's the same system we've got right now. Teachers bring whatever data they've got. We want to put to the greatest degree possible teacher referral out of business, okay? Now, again, don't take that like I don't like we don't do referrals, but we know that it's inefficient. Some teachers refer, some teachers do not refer. Okay. Some teachers refer a lot, some teachers haven't referred in years. Okay. It's inefficient. 
It doesn't level the playing field. And some of the research suggests that referral is often biased, especially at the primary grades, okay? When girls have to read twice as poorly as boys to be referred. Look at your groups. Look at your special ed groups. They're almost always boys. But for every boy who doesn't read very well, there's a girl out there, but they don't show up on the radar. And they are equally at risk for school adjustment problems. So let's, to the grace degree possible, look at all of our data systematically, all of our fourth graders, all of our fifth graders, all of our ninth graders, okay? And again, there's some subtleties and nuances in this. And let's say who's a good candidate for intervention in scheduled intervention in fall of 10th grade. Let's do that, okay? Level the playing field by gender, ethnicity. Okay, and here's the deal. Triage, okay? If a kid needs tier three, they get tier three. We're not going to have kids go into, you know, a, a tier two intervention if we know that it isn't intense enough to help a student with a severe performance discrepancy. Okay. So here's how I triage. Simple example. Remember, this is an illustration, and all of the major publishers produce their data in a form of a box and whisker chart. Okay. The green box in this instance is average. Remember, Orange is below average, and uh, below the orange line is well below average. Here is Billy. If Billy were in the bottom quarter, I'd consider tier two. Billy's not in the bottom quarter. He's in the bottom 10%. I would consider tier three. Remember, don't get rigid. Now, when we start thinking about how we're going to determine our cut scores. And this is so simple. Here's the parameters I charge a school with. And you, not surprising, discover schools are really good at this. I did a bunch of things in North Dakota a few years ago. And the principal said, you know, if we started thinking this way, we could actually plan. It's like, well, no kidding. So I'm going to start with the idea that kids at risk need daily intervention. Okay, can we provide daily intervention? And I'm going to use these guidelines. These are the questions I asked. Can you provide tier two, 30 minutes a day in groups of four to six? That's supplemental to tier one. How many groups would we need? How many hours? or minutes of intervention that we need. I'll show you an example here shortly. Now for tier three, these are my design principles. Can we provide 60 minutes a day in a little bit smaller groups of three to five that's supplemental or maybe even supplanted to tier one core instruction? How many, re what resources? Now why these time frames? Because I can tell you, that the interventions that are useful for kids that are below average tend to be shorter, usually about 30, 20 to 30 minutes. I can tell you that the interventions designed for kids that are very discrepant, the really good ones, tend to be 40, 45, 50 minutes a day. And if you don't deliver them as intended, you're not going to reduce the achievement gap. Now, the question is, can we do this? And I have yet to be stumped that schools can't figure out a way. Okay, now, remember, don't get rigid about the numbers. Here is, okay, different ways to deliver tier two. Now, I don't want people to get paralyzed, okay, because I too often see Tier two is something that general ed teachers do in addition to delivering the core. And you know what? If I'm a teacher, I'm hating MTSS. Two years ago, I didn't do this. I just taught kids, referred them for special ed. Okay? 
got rid of a few of the kids in my class in terms of reading that I didn't couldn't reach. But now you're telling me you got to do them too? Okay? Let's avoid this to the greatest degree possible. Now, you could do this strategically and have deliver, teachers deliver tier two in addition to the core if you did flexible skill grouping across classes within a grade. Now, I, I can't go into the strengths and weaknesses of each of these other approaches, but this at least makes it so it's not as much work as number one. If I'm really good and clever, I could do flexible skill grouping across classes, across grades, and get really differentiated instruction. None of these three methods require additional resources. I could do before and after school, but teachers can't decide that. The school or district has to decide that. I could do computerized interventions, okay, but I get very nervous about having kids that are um, at risk or discrepant in front of computers for sustained periods of time, issues of engagement and goofing around. You know, I, I can do it, but I'm going to be very conservative. A school could create universal periods by cutting, say, five minutes out of this, five minutes out of that, and have a period where everyone gets intervention. I'm, 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 I'm okay with it. It's not my first, second, third choice, but I could live with it if that's the best you can do. But my preferred model is the district decides that we're going to actually build a system coordinating all of our available talent that's not that general ed teacher, okay, to be able to build a system of supports, get this, listen carefully, we're building a system of supports, not just for students, but a system of supports for those general ed teachers. Now, wouldn't that be cool that a general ed teacher says, you know, my job is to teach the core and provide reasonable differentiated instruction. And they've actually built a system of supports for me to meet the needs of all of the kids in my class. So yes, we build a system of supports for the students, but we're building a system of supports for teachers as well. Now, here's my example. This is real life, gang. Ooh, bad layering. Oh my goodness. So let's take a look at just second grade, okay? If I were going to provide, okay, there's a, this is a school with uh, second grade as 68 kids. Um, and if I wanted to provide services to my most needy uh, tier two candidates um, uh, with 68 kids, that would be uh, about 17. If my group size were, uh, you know, five, um, I could do three groups or I could do four groups. If I did four groups, geez, I might actually have 18, 19 kids that are in tier two. If I tallied up at 30 minutes for each of those four groups, that would be 120 minutes a day of intervention I would need. 120 minutes translates into two hours of intervention. Okay, so two hours of intervention, that's basically about a third time FTE. If I took the same analysis and, and looked at first grade, I could meet the needs of all of my tier two service delivery with a person who's three quarter time, less than one FTE to provide services of supports for the kids, 30 minutes a day, okay, groups of five, a system of supports for the teachers. This analysis, how many people do I need? Can I use trained Title I aides? Absolutely with a good program. Can I use Title I with a really good, yeah, absolutely. There are ways that we can provide organized supports for our general ed teachers. So, I want to end here, oh my goodness, with the triangles, okay? Because again, if we look at them, this is what we see. And I can tell you, um, I'm a contributor to the triangles 
It was a motel room in La Jolla in 1998 uh, for a big uh, presentation I had to do the next day with a former colleague. So, um, you know, um, I, I worry, excuse me, we don't often know where these cut scores come from with different publishers, okay? So what's the criterion test that they use that they say makes a kid at risk or not? What's the math that they used? Can, does anybody understand that? We place faith in the publishers, okay, that they use the right test for our kids, the right cut scores, the right math, and it's just unbelievably trusting, okay, without being able to dig in deep. It's hard for me to understand. What happens in lower achieving schools is you'll over identify. You'll have everybody in tier two and tier three. In higher achieving schools, you'll under identify. Now I like the data, but I like it as value added. In my wife's school, there are kids that teachers say are my most needy kids. But compared to other places, um, they're not nearly as at risk. Okay, now let me show you an example and then my goodness, ouch. This is, okay, a school where you've got, you know, about 12% of kids that based on their benchmarking and screening, you know, would have very few kids identified, okay? And here's what would happen. Schools won't use the data. Teachers will sit down and say, this is the most needy kid I've, I've seen in years. And you're telling me this kid's not at risk. Even special ed kids, would not be at risk in this uh, based on these data. And schools will ignore the data, use other data. It'll be business as usual and chaotic. In this school, do you really think you're gonna provide tier two to more than half, you know, to, to a little bit more than half your kids? No, you're not going, this is a core problem. When you've got data like this, that says your core, is not intense enough. And, and I should add, uh, you should already know this, okay? In this set of circumstances, if you use the data, you're gonna over-identify, which means your intervention is gonna be weak, your intervention is gonna be overstretched, and schools are not gonna use your data very well. Now take a look at this fall to winter data in this district that I was working with, okay? The fall data suggests the core program isn't strong enough. You've got a whole bunch of kids that are at risk, okay? And, and guess what? They're more at risk at winter. Doesn't mean they're not learning, they're just falling farther behind. If you're working in a school like this and, and using the idea to provide intervention to kids under these circumstances, it ain't gonna happen. You'll over-identify if you take the data meaningful, meaningfully or else you just won't use the data and it'll be the same old system. Plus you're gonna really hate data. What's it gonna look like next time? Is it even worse? Which means we'll stop collecting it and MTSS will not progress. Okay, so I'm running pretty much out of time. I don't know if there are any questions. I'm not going anywhere. So if, if, you know, there are probably four or five, six more slides on, you know, using end of the year data and a little bit on, you know, reducing the achievement gap in terms of goal setting. But bottom line is, okay, if we go back into what it is that I'm sort of trying to accomplish, I'm trying to accomplish these big ideas, okay? Comments, questions, anybody there? There is a question. Um, the question is, what are your thoughts about winter screening in December versus January? Um, I think part of that has to do with the winter break question. Yeah, doesn't matter to me. Okay, the, what I'm really looking for in that repeated assessment is growth and development. I don't think, think I don't think kids are going to grow <laughs> much over winter break, so I, I I have some issues with public, and I understand why they do this. But publishers setting these windows for benchmarking that if you don't complete the benchmarking in these recommended windows, you can't enter data. 
you know, and you know, you're not going to contaminate their database. Um, and and schools have their own unique set of circumstances. I mean, I see schools that have one week, two weeks, three weeks of winter break, and you can't you can't standardize some of that stuff. So does it really matter? I'm going to argue for growth and development. Their kids are not certainly growing. I, I doubt it over, win, over you know, winter break. Um, are they getting worse over winter break? I can't imagine why. Like two weeks of vacation, all of a sudden they don't read very well. Um, I, don't, I, you know, I don't really worry about that so much. But growth and development. And then for screening, uh, you, you should already know who those kids are based on your fall screen. They're not going to all of a sudden magically pop up and have you know seven kids in third grade that are now now need uh, would be good candidates. Okay, I I don't see it. Okay, now you might you know, have a different set of circumstances than my experience, but I've never really seen much of that. Thank you for that response. I hope it made sense. No, it definitely did. Um, are there any other questions? We are right at two thirty. Do you have any? more time, Dr. Shin, if there are more. Of course, but the recording will probably stop, but that doesn't mean it's not important. Okay. So feel free to put them in the chat if you still have questions. Um, while we wait for you all to process and put any of those questions or comments in there, I will also put in the um, evaluation for you all to complete. And I will also put in um, my um, the information for how to get onto the OK Edge platform one more time. And I'm going to put in our agenda, a link to our agenda. Um, that will give you um, some information about the recorded sessions that we have, as well as um, information about these sessions if you want to encourage other people to come see the sessions that we had live today and available today for you. And then I will also put in my contact information one more time in case you have any questions or concerns that you'd like to contact me about. Well, I hope this has made sense to people. And I hope that you've gotten a sense that you can simplify, okay? You know, so there's this phrase by Michael Schmoker, which means do less than obsess. Okay, Michael Schmoker is big in school change, and I just love that concept. Let's do less than obsess. Okay, what a wonderful permission giving statement. But the, the first part is do less, but the second part says let's get really good at it. Let's get really, really good at it. Let me, let me be clear. Oral reading is not the only data we would ever, ever, ever collect. Okay, but I'm a really big fan of placement tests that come with intervention programs, okay? That gives us, we don't need to do this intense diagnosis. We should be using, you know, if we're doing an intervention program, uh, like, you know, a good one for young kids is called SIPs. That's got placement tests. So you don't need all of this fine-grained information. Look, let's put the kid in unit 27 or something like that. Okay, um, we've also dropped the evaluation into the chat. And if there aren't any more questions, I guess we will see you later. I really wanna encourage you guys to please check into that platform and our sessions we have. We're gonna have sessions on social emotional learning. We have sessions on equity, sessions on collaborative leadership. We have a, just an introduction to Otis and the overview of basics of Otis if you're interested in that. So I really encourage you, there's a bunch of really cool sessions on there as well as the three live sessions that will be available um, in the next couple of days. So really encourage you guys to go and check that out and encourage your friends to check it out as well. What an opportunity. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So it's great. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. And again, if you need anything from me, my links are in the chat. My contact information is in the chat as well. So thank you, Dr. Shin, so much for being here. We oh, really appreciate smart, you. By the way, so Mark, unless you're a lawyer. Uh, <laughs> <but> yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. It, uh, you know, it's nice to feel like, you know, real life instead of COVID. Yeah. 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 Well,
we would love to have you back to Oklahoma one time. We had you here in, eight, I think, 2018. So maybe someday we can get you back in the stage. So. <laughs> and remember, you know, the, you know the, if there it was that sort of one hour discussion point, if you want to schedule that, you know, do that. OK, anytime you'd like, regardless of contract, just I hate to sort of present and then zip, you know, I know it's just so it's so difficult this way. It really is. Yeah. It really is. But at another time, if people get a chance to read the materials, digest the whole thing that you're doing uh, and you want to schedule something, you know, let's just do it. OK, I will okay. let you know. Sounds great. Sounds awesome. And if, if I get any questions, I'll forward them.